Welcome to Strategies for Working with Children with Visual and Multiple Impairments in the Classroom. I'm Nancy Moulton. I'm the Program Director for Education Services for Blind and Visually Impaired Children, a program of Catholic Charities, Maine. And I'm Lori Spencer. I'm a teacher visually impaired and an orientation and mobility specialist and a CBI mentor for me. The goals of today are to understand the implications of vision loss with particular emphasis on cortical visual impairment, which we call CVI, and children with multiple disabilities. We want you to understand your resources and to develop a perspective that progress occurs over time. Consistency is the key. What you'll need, there'll be an activity a little later on in the, in the webinar, and you'll need some black construction paper, some white paper, crayons and markers, scissors and glue, and maybe objects that would represent some functional activities. And we'll get to all of that later on. So who we are. Education Services for Blind and Visually Impaired Children, we, the program is called ESBVIC. We hold the contact through the state of Maine, Vision for the Blind and Visually Impaired, they're also known as DBVI, to provide teachers of the visually impaired, TVIs, to assist schools in the education of children who are blind or visually impaired. We have 17 TVI positions in the state of Maine. We have one instructional materials center um, coordinator, and she keeps track of all of the large print braille materials and also some other instructional materials that we use. One administrative assistant and one program director. The Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired has blindness rehab specialists and transition consultant positions, voc rehab counselors, and orientation and mobility instructors. The IRIS network provides rehabilitation services for those over 14 years of age and mostly um, adults in the older population. So who does what? ESBVIC employs all the TVIs throughout the entire state. Services are provided through the contract with DBVI at no cost to local schools. All referrals for services for visually impaired children come through Catholic Charities Maine. So if you have a student that you're thinking about referring, even if you're thinking about that child from orientation mobility, the referral goes through Catholic Charities. We do the initial assessment for the functional vision assessment, and then we can, can discuss with the team providing if, if orientation mobility instruction is, is needed, we would certainly make that referral at that point. If you have questions or concerns about TVI services, you're going to contact the program director, that's me, Nancy Moulton, at nmoulton, so it's n-m-o-u-l-t-o-n, at ccmaine.org. The Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired, DVVI, provides certified orientation and mobility specialists otherwise known as COMS, who work with people of all ages throughout the state. DBVI also provides vocational rehabilitation services to students 14 and older, and they have the um, transition consultant blindness rehab specialist positions as well um, to help uh, young students kind of navigate prior to entering the voc rehab system, kind of being prepared for that system. If you have questions or concerns about these services, you're going to contact Samantha Benderson, and her email is samantha.j.fenderson at maine.gov. So services. ESBVIC serves children with blindness and visual impairments from birth through 20 years old or the completion of high school in their educational environment, wherever that might be. The referrals come through the IEP IFSP 504 process, and they should be listed in the plan. We may provide direct and or consultative services to students with a documented visual impairment. So to make the referral, the application and releases can be found on our website. If you go to um, www.ccmain.org, uh, you can um, navigate there, A to Z services, and then you find our program, Education Services for Blind and Visually Impaired Children, and you'll find the application, or the link is included in this PowerPoint. It must be accompanied by an eye doctor's report before we can act on it. We are happy to send for that report, but to process the application, we have to have that eye report. So if, just understand, if you only send the application, we still need, the, you know, in terms of timelines, we still have to get that eye report before we can act on an application. If there's evidence of a visual impairment from that eye report, a TVI will be assigned to complete a functional vision assessment. 
If a visual impairment is not evident, the school will be contacted for more information to determine if an assessment is warranted. Um, I strongly advise, there's a blank on that application where it asks what you've noticed about your child's vision. I strongly advise you really write in there what you're noticing, particularly if it's a student with multiple disabilities, that we can really try to tease out from that a little bit um, what, what might be going on visually for the child. Typically, the functional vision assessment is done in the educational environment with a preschool student or infant. That might be the home. So these are some pictures of what an FBA could look like, particularly an FBA when, when it's a student with multiple challenges. The FBA consists of informal observations along with specific assessment tasks geared to determine how the child's using their vision. Often we use the Christine Roman Lancy CDI range as we observe students with a diagnosis or suspicion of cortical visual impairment. There are times that we will get a referral from an eye doctor and, and we will see that eye report and cortical visual impairment is not necessarily um, diagnosed but that we may suspect it and the student may operate with some of the characteristics of cortical visual impairment and so we certainly want to look at those children. When evaluating students with multiple challenges, we utilize a variety of familiar and unfamiliar materials to provide the team with information regarding how the child uses their vision and strategies for instruction. So when we look at strategies for instruction, wait, wait, wait. Give students time to process and keep quiet while doing so. The more you talk, the more complicated it is for the child. Sometimes we can we have to wait several minutes for a child to give them the time they deserve and they have a right to in order to process information. Progress takes time and consistency. Sometimes you may feel like you're not making any progress. It's very slow sometimes. Keep at it and it has to be done consistently. So it might take a long time before you see progress, but don't give up. Objects before pictures. Sometimes teams will jump to um, giving students pictures for their object for their schedules, and we suggest that this needs to make sense. Kids need to understand what those pictures would even mean. So we start with objects. They need to demonstrate they understand the meaning of an object before they're able to use pictures. Your TVI will help the team determine the student's level, and moving from objects to pictures is a process. Utilize your TVIs. They are a great resource and they'll help you figure this out. Just understand that that's typically the process that we use. So this is a picture of an object schedule and there are some, you know, it's very simple and there are objects there that represent particular activities and then there's a finished box. So when you've finished with the activity, you place it in the box. And this is a picture of a student using her schedule. And she's moved on. She's using pictures. And she takes the picture. She puts it up on the board, does the activity, and then moves on to put it in the finished box. So cortical visual impairment. We're going to turn this over to Lori. Um, first, I guess we're going to try to watch a, a short. Um, we're going to only watch a portion of this um, uh, YouTube video. So just to give you an idea of what a little, little girl's um, journey uh, has been. So. You can have all the best ideas in the world, but if people don't know about it, then it doesn't matter. I needed to have a website that Take 
just a, a snip of what um, her journey has been. Now if we can move back to the PowerPoint, we'll be in good shape. Let's see. Okay. And, all right. So I'm going to let Lori now talk about some of the characteristics of CBI. And, and okay, so CBI... <clears throat> I think we better first talk about what cortical visual impairment is. And, and one of the hardest things with this is to sort of put our ideas of ocular visual impairments aside. The idea of acuity and making things bigger and brighter and all that type of thing. CDI is typically diagnosed by having a normal eye report. In other words, the eyes are functioning fine, normally. Sometimes kids might have something, but typically it's a normal eye report, but they have a neurological diagnosis. And this can be numerous different things. It can be stroke, it can be diseases, it can be trauma, but somehow the visual pathways in the brain have been interrupted. And so we tend to think of CBI as not being an eye problem, but a brain problem. And so we have found that this CDI, rather than looking at acuities and size and so on, we look at these 10 characteristics. Color, movement, latency, visual fields, complexity, light gazing, distance viewing, reflective responses, novelty, and visual motor responses. Now when we do this assessment, we typically can put these kids into three areas, phase one, phase two, and phase three. Later on. I'm not sure. Yes, we do. Okay, go back, though. Let's, let's, uh oh, maybe she can't go back. That's okay. So, that's all right. So, phase one, um, when we're talking about phase one, this is building consistent visual behaviors. So, let's talk about these these characteristics. Kids who are in phase one typically can only respond to one color at a time. Their brain is then hardwired. Often these colors are red or yellow. Those are the two colors that are seen most easily in the, in the brain. Sometimes it might be a blue or a green, but often it's red or yellow. Movement is very important. Movement elicits a visual response and movement happens in the periphery so often we might start out with one of these kids showing them something off to the left slightly left or right um, and they might be looking elsewhere we wait we wait this is that latency piece latency refers to a delay in a visual response it takes time for the brain to notice there's something out there, it's red, it's moving, okay, I'm going to turn and look at it. It might be an eye turn or a head turn. So these are the major things. Now the, the important thing about CBI that we've got to keep in mind going throughout all of these phases is that CBI is not static. The whole idea of this is to move these kids from one phase to the next. 
And so we want to get out of this phase one as early as possible, as soon as possible. Hopefully we might just be talking weeks or months um, that we can move these kids on into phase two. So phase two then, we're not talking about just looking at objects. Phase two, we're talking about integrating vision with function. That idea that I see something, I can grab it. I can put it in my mouth. I can make it make music. I can do something with these items that I see. So as we get into phase two, these characteristics might change a little bit. So now the idea with color, a student might be able to look at an object that has two or three colors on it. That they now begin to movement at near might be important, but it may not be. I can look at an object that's just sitting on my tray, I can look at it, and then I can start to reach out to it. Now what often happens, and this is part of the complexity piece, is that, that students with CBI have difficulty looking and touching at the same time. So you get what's called a look, look away response, where they'll look out, they'll see that Elmo sitting there, and just as they reach to touch it, their head will sort of swing back or up, they grab it, and then they can come back down and look at it again. But that initial response is very difficult. Some of the other issues at phase two has to do, and this is one of the most important ones, is complexity. There's two parts to complexity. There's the complexity of the object itself. And what looks to us like a very simple object actually might be very complex um, to this student. So we've got to really tease out just how many um, colors. It might be that we can only still have one item if that item has two or more colors, or maybe if we have all items that are red, we can have two items that we can be looking at and choosing which one we're going to touch. The other part of complexity has to do with the environment and the visual array. What's going on around us? We all know some of our classrooms, they are busy. There's lots of people talking. There are hundreds and thousands of items around the room and so on. So we want to block out as much of that as we can. When a student is first learning to look and touch or look and grab, we may need to move into a quieter room. We may need to put up a black trifold board to block out all the visual um, items around us so they can concentrate just on that one item and make it pop out. That makes it easier for them to look, to reach. At this point in phase two, we're still pretty well in near space. Typically, not more two to four, maybe five feet, um, that type of thing. Let me tell you about novelty. Novelty is an interesting one. That has to do with familiar objects. Often, when I go into a home, a parent will say, oh, they have this favorite toy, and they always look right at it. Well, then you could show them a very similar toy, but maybe it's a different color, and they literally don't see it. They literally will not look at it. And that's that difference between having something novel, something new, or, uh, excuse me, something new and something very familiar. So when we first start, we may warm up with some familiar things, but then we can quickly move into getting something new out there, and as long as it has maybe some red in it, if that's our favorite color, or maybe if I move it a little, they can still look at that object. Now the wait time is still important here. It may be in phase two, that our latency, we're not waiting for 10 seconds, maybe there's just a one or two second delay. However, what I also find is, in phase two, that these students will now quickly look at an item, 
that immediately, once you show it to them, they turn right to it and look at it. But the wait time may now be important on waiting for them to do something with that item. So now we still have latency with that reach. I have to motor plan, get my arms ready, look at it, reach out and grab it. So phase three, that's the resolution or close to resolution of CBI characteristics. And this, we're talking about getting up into higher level visual responses here. So we can now view two-dimensional material. This is extremely important when we're talking about communication with many of our multiply impaired kids. Often people want to start right off the bat with pictures. Until a student is in phase three, they will not be able to visually discriminate pictures. They may look at it, but they'll have no idea what they're looking at. It just all blends together. I, I often think about some of those pet symbols just looking at a big flattened spider like Garfield always smacks his spiders, and that's kind of what they look like. So up until that point, if we have a student in phase one or phase two, we're talking object symbols. When we get to phase three, we can start looking at two-dimensional materials. Distance vision now may extend up to 10 feet and even 20 feet. That still may require to start with going back to some of those anchors, like red, using a red outline on something at 20 feet, or moving it a little bit, or making sure we're in a quiet space, but we can at least start working at that level now. At this point in phase three, we will, we're talking about using vision to imitate action. And this is where some of that facial vision comes into play. If, if you have a student who is not looking at faces yet, they're not going to be able to imitate what you do with them. So that's really important to remember. In phase three, we typically start seeing kids looking at people um, and pairing faces with the voices that they're hearing. The complexity issue at phase three is still going to be very important, but it's going to be different. Now, when you look at this picture, the one on the left of our students, this was an interesting one. Um, she was in a car accident, was, had total normal visual functioning, was in a car accident. When I first met her, she literally was zero on the scale. She had no visual responses. So after leaving hospital, she went back to school. We had some, excuse me, we had some phase one intervention. She was literally just looking at objects. We had to pick a color for her, so we picked red. And she started looking at things. And within, and within about four months, I get a call from her TV saying, "You've got to come see this." And so you can see the objects, the slinky, the ribbon, and that she had been looking at, and she was able to scan her tray or table in front of her and find these things. And, and then, so I went to see her, and literally, we went from looking at these objects and two or three objects at once, and I thought, I just want to try this. I took a card, drew a line on it, and asked her if she could trace the line. Now, you notice it's in red. I'm still using her favorite color. Um, and she could trace it. Now, asking her if she remembered um, what horizontal and vertical was, she could remember that one was up and down and one was side to side, and that's fine. And so then she could literally look at those and, and tell me if it was side to side or up and down. Now, the picture on the right, you'll see her doing a pretty complex um, video game. Now that is about eight months later, but it's still, you can see how fast this gal moved from one face to the other. And I will say that is more typical for somebody who had a trauma that had visual functioning before. 
But I just want you to keep in mind that this is what we're going for. We're, we're not talking about sitting there tracking objects from side to side for months and months and months. We want to move from one phase to another as fast as we possibly can. Okay, so here we go with complexity. This is, this is what I was telling you about the text symbol. All right, can you find the cat? There is a cat in this picture. And this is often, when you look up into space in your classroom, and all those instantly thousands of objects around your room hit your brain, and you are able to just less than seconds sort out what it is you're looking for, that little box of crayons, you can pick that out. For a kiddo with a complexity problem, this is what it's like looking out into space. Everything just blends into everything else. However, now, can you find the cat? I used your favorite color, yellow. Look at it, it just pops. We can pick it out. That's what we're talking about using those anchors and either highlighting, maybe if we had moved the cat, you could have found it, which I can't do on this slide, but that's what we're talking about using these CBI characteristics and making adaptations. So the next slide, so now you can see the cat, I just have it circled, and so if you went back to that other slide, you'd be able to look at that cat and you'd be able to find it now. So that's what we do. We start with highlighting, outlining, and then we can fade that out. Okay, go ahead. So this time we want you to look at some of the environment things because we want you to, to think about things you would do the same and things that you might do differently um, when you look at this video. And again, we're just going to show a short clip of it. I'm dreaming, but there's a voice inside my head that you'll never reach it. Every step I'm taking, every move I make feels lost with no direction. My faith is shaking, but I, I gotta keep trying. Gotta keep. Okay, that just gives you a little bit of a, a glimpse into one family's journey with um, CDI. One of the things I, I um, and you can, we can go, they go they back, go back and look at that, right? Okay. So yep. If you want to go back and relook at that, I want you to look at, at some interesting thing that just popped right out to me. One of the things is go back and look, when you watch that video, notice that Erin is never looking at her dad's face. Okay, remember, we don't look at faces until phase three. Faces are the most complex thing to look at. They're so similar, they change as we talk, they change as we change makeup, glasses, not glasses, it, it's really difficult. So if you go back and look, she's never quite looking at, at her dad. It's always eyes or head off to the side. Another, if you notice, there was the one toy, it was blue, it was very simple, um, and it had, it had it was blue on the outside and had a yellow um, tactile circle on the inside. And you see her hand coming out to reach it. Look at where her head is. It's turned aside. That, that look away as you're reaching. 
So even though it's everything is set up um, this pretty simply, that touching and looking at the same time is still very difficult. Definitely a phase two. And the last one is if you looked at when um, somebody was holding her, she kind of all bent over, and someone's holding a toy down by her foot. Again, the head is over to the side. So there's lots of things happening. She's having somebody hold her. I don't know if somebody's talking to her. That's where we don't talk. If we want somebody looking at something, there's so much happening. You've got to button it up. Tell her you're going to show her something and then put it out there and give her time to look without all that additional stimuli coming in. Okay, so we've been talking a little bit about all these objects and pictures and, and so on. And one of the big, big things we do um, with all of our students, regardless of age, is literacy. Literacy is so important for education. And one of the things that I really, really like are the language experience stories for two reasons. One is that for our, for our students, they really can relate to these because they happen to them. There are things that they understand as opposed to Cinderella going to the mall in her glass slipper and changing pumpkin. I mean, it, it, you know, that's not real relatable. But a language experience story is something based on what our students do every day or often type, type thing. The, the other part of the language experience stories is that we can make them as simple or as complex as our students need, and we can change them. So what I'd like you to do right now is to create a language experience story based on Something that happens in your student's routine. This could be something as simple as a toothbrushing story. It could be a lunch story, what it takes to go to lunch, getting your tray, um, finding the food, sitting at the table, getting your fork, whatever. But So this is what you need to know. What phase is your student in? So think about it. Are they in that building um, visual behavior phase? Are they in phase two where they're actually touching objects, using objects to some extent? Or are they in phase three and can actually handle some, some pictures, maybe very simple or complex? If they're in that phase one, phase two, you're going to need objects. If they're in phase three, you possibly can use some simple pictures. So I want you to pause this. Go ahead, get out your paper. If you don't have the objects you need, you can at least brainstorm the objects you would need for each page. Most of these language experience stories, certainly in phase one and phase two, may be three or four pages long. That's all we're talking about. One idea per page. And, um, and it just, with just the object or just the picture. In phase two, with the picture, you might be able to add a word or two. So go ahead and pause your, your webinar, make your book, and then come back when you're done. Okay. So remember that TVIs will assist with adaptations and modifications of classroom environment and curriculum. So. As we said earlier, we've really focused a lot on CVI here, but it, you, your student may not have CVI. And, and just know that if it, either way, that we are there to help you figure things out. And this is, this is a book that was made for us, and it's just those felt um, pads that go under chairs. So they're tactile, and um, you could actually take them off if you needed to. So. OK. Building literacy skills. So as, as Lori said, literacy is just critical for students at all levels. So read, read, read. It can be very simple or it can be more complex. Story time is valuable for all children. Um, the first stages of literacy begin with just naming the object. Um, then we pair objects with stories so that language has meaning. 
story boxes are something we sometimes do that bring meaning to books. So if you're doing a story with a classroom of children, and it might be um, a book about the mitten, and you might do a little box or a bag, and you'd have a mitten in there, and you might have a piece of clothesline in there, and a hat. So you want to try to make literacy, make reading meaningful to students. So I put some general resources here. There are some great resources out there. Um, Perkins offers some, through their e-learning, they offer all types of information, webinars, videos, um, that type of a thing. Um, there is a website called pathtoliteracy.org. That offers a number of resources and teachers and parents, everybody contributes to that. So it's not one person putting that out there or even one entity. That's done with um, Perkins and Texas School for the Blind, I think have collaborated on that website and, and all kinds of people contribute to that and they have great ideas for students at all levels of literacy. Some story boxers, this is a specific um, section of the Path to Literacy. Um, that tells you how to make a story box and there's a lot of resources out there that will name the book and then tell you what objects to go find so it takes a little of the work out of it for you you just go find them <laughs> and then object calendars we didn't talk too much about object calendars but to give students you know structure in their day rather than just telling them because they may not be processing what you're saying so to give those objects and so for each activity they take the object they bring it with them to the activity Hopefully they use that object even momentarily in that activity. When they're finished, it goes into the finished box and then they go back and look to see what's next. If I can yeah. wait, Nancy, we, um, I am a huge one about object calendars or some people call them symbol shelves is, it, is another one. And there's one thing about this because I will often have teachers tell me, oh, they know what's coming next. Okay. Your student may actually know what's coming next, um, and they may know because you've given them a verbal hint, or they actually may know, but here's the deal. They may know, but do they have any way of telling us what's coming next or what they want to do? And by starting with the symbol shelves and the object calendars, this is a huge reinforcer for communication, both receptive, telling them what's coming next, but expressive. And the most exciting thing in the world is when a student looks at like this picture here and sees number one, but they really don't want to do that, and they reach over and they grab number two and hand it to you because this is what I really want to do. And that is so exciting. So um, I think you'll find that most of us TBIs are often really pushing the object calendars. They're, it's huge. It's a, it's a great resource and an independent um, idea for our students. And, and to add one more thing, um, in this particular object calendar, what you're seeing are three boxes. Um, you know, it's perfectly okay to start with two, first this, then that, and then to expand. Don't go hog wild and try to do an object calendar for the entire day with a child when they're first starting. Um, you you want to do the, take it slow and use your TBI. So now what? If you need specific information, contact your TBI and or your O&M instructor if it's about mobility and moving around, um, they will help. They can provide in-service to staff who will be working with your student. They'll help you determine which resources will be most helpful um, with your particular student. So this presentation will be archived on the ESBVIC page of www.ccmain.org. Thank you. A certificates of attendance would be emailed. If you email Sue Shane, she can send you a, a certificate. All right. Thank you so much for attending.